here is, is Michael, um, who's going to be telling us about his work on uh, detecting and analyzing ADHD using social media. Thank you, Michael. Thanks very much, uh, Mike or Joy. Thank you for not attempting that. Uh, it's really uh, work mostly by my students, Noel and Claire, who can't be here because they're enjoying their new life in San Francisco. Slightly warmer today. Next week, San Francisco is going to be 25 degrees. So yes, <laughs> consider your life choices. Uh, so, uh, so this project was uh, supported early on uh, by IBM with some compute resources and software support, uh, no current conflicts of interest. Unfortunately, if you want to give me money, by all means. Uh, the University of Toronto does, does pay me some money, uh, but I don't think there is any need to mitigate that particular bias. Uh, so I'm very happy that my talk was scheduled to be after Dr. Ortiz's because I think it's in a way a compliment to what you are doing. Uh, so, Basically, what I want to do is I want to take data from social media where people are talking about the symptoms and try to get insights into complex diseases in that way. So specifically, we're focusing on patients with anxiety symptoms who may later also get an ADHD diagnosis, or at least might think that they should get an ADHD diagnosis. So... The way we do it is we go on Reddit, which is public, uh, and our uh, REV uh, thankfully said that's okay. Uh, so we go on Reddit, it's public, and we say for the people who post in the anxiety subreddit, that's a forum on Reddit, are they in the future going to also post in the ADHD subreddit? So that to us is a signal, maybe not 100% reliable, that those people might first present with anxiety and then also be potentially diagnosed, maybe self-diagnosed with ADHD. And the trick here is we have the timestamps. So we can get all the posts from people before they may be posted on the, on the ADHD subreddit when they're just in anxiety. And we can try to say, can our machine learning classifier tell the people who just have anxiety and never post an ADHD from the people who first posted an, an anxiety and then also moved on to ADHD. So that's our operation operationalization. And the, the classifier just sees the post before they went on ADHD. Right? So we then, after we successfully build it, and by the way, that took us three years. So the classical approaches did not work. So it's just like Noel tried Roberta and after two and a half years, literally, uh, it's, and that started working. So I think that's a nice aspect of this work as well. So we get the classifier, we then visualize explanations for the output of the classifier. The idea there would be, we'll talk about it later, we both have some notion maybe for the clinician. This is why this person might also then get an ADHD diagnosis. And also, uh, just from a scientific point of view, we want to know why, why is that? Uh, why kind of what characterizes those kinds of patients who present with anxiety and then might also be diagnosed with ADHD? And the point I want to make, so this is kind of a bigger research project than this, is you have millions, millions of data points on social media out there with people talking a lot about their disease, about their, about their symptoms. We can leverage that in order to better understand, I think, all sorts of diseases. So Dr. Ortiz said 300 patients every couple of months. I imagine for maybe 30 minutes, maybe, maybe even less most of the time. That is orders and orders of magnitude less than you can get from people talking about their symptoms online. Of course, there is downsides as well, but I think you could get a lot of insights that way. Uh, so the learning outcomes, uh, I think we we're supposed to do that. Nobody else did it, but well, I, I talked about it, so there it is. Uh, the judges <laughs> take note. Uh, so, so ADHD and anxiety. Uh, so uh, there's various estimates, but up to 50% of adults uh, with ADHD may also have an anxiety disorder, 
that's an inverted conditional probability, but it still gets you uh, kind of some notion of, yes, like the, the, there is comorbidity there and it's quite common. Uh, with children, about 30% of children with HD have anxiety. So again, you can go and read the studies. Uh, so we specifically started out with the idea of, we noticed, well, not, not me, I'm not a clinician, but we noticed that uh, people with anxiety often get diagnosed with ADHD. And you, like, you can see how that would happen given those statistics. So what we do, we want to predict the future. I want to say ADHD concerns using social media, right? So just in a more organized way. So the potential applications are we have more timely diagnosis of ADHD potentially. Of course, that would require the patients to give consent. Like here's all my social media data, Mr. Psychiatrist, please, please take a look. They, they might not agree, uh, but potentially. Uh, so again, if they consent, could be automated suggestions for, hey, like you might like to make an appointment and in Ontario, probably in about 12 months, you'll get that appointment uh, to, if you do, uh, to maybe have a psychiatrist talk to you. Uh, so, but again, like if you can automate it, maybe you can reduce the load, uh, uh, the workload of the psychiatrist, right? Uh, so interesting to me, kind of the immediate thing is we might get better understanding of how ADHD presents in patients with anxiety. And we'll talk about it a little bit uh, in a second. So again, what's the trick here? The trick is get the social media data and then just cut off uh, for each poster, cut off the time for when they started posting an ADHD, just use the anxiety posts and then try to tell the anxiety posts from people who will switch to ADHD, we happen to know from people who never will. So uh, here's kind of the CS aspects here. So we tried all sorts of things. So like the first thing anyone would say, like try logistic regression, it's usually almost as good as anything else, not in this case. So the base rate here for the test set is 50% switch to ADHD, not switch, but start to post it in ADHD as well, and 50 didn't. And logistic regression can tell 54% of the time whether they switched or not. So basically nothing. Uh, multinomial name phase, if you tune it, it's, it starts kind of, kind of picking up some kind of signal, but basically not. We plugged it into Roberta and almost right away we got to 76%. So that's actually picking something up. So what this is saying is that if you just look at individual keywords in isolation, you get nothing, no signal. So Roberta picks up on something that, that you, you wouldn't see otherwise. Uh, so I think that's, that's interesting and that's unusual. Uh, and well, so there is, if, if you know about kind of neural scaling laws, people call it, so sometimes it happens that, that when you scale up your model to whatever number of billion parameters, suddenly it starts working. And I think this is actually an illustration of that. Uh, trust me, we tried really, really hard to make kind of the basic models work. It just doesn't. So we also wanted to explore the explanations for why the model says what it does. So the basic thing that we tried first is we just try to say, okay, we'll mask out every word in turn and see how that affects the output of the classifier. The idea being that if a particular word when masked out affects the output of the classifier, well, that's probably important. And it kind of gives you something that makes sense, right? So the highlighted words there uh, are indicative of this is just anxiety, not ADHD. So, we then said, okay, maybe we should look at phrases. And in our experience, I can only show you a limited amount, but in our experience, phrases actually do something interesting. So the phrases that get highlighted, you can kind of see just intuitively, I think, that it's probably inside. Here's an example of a positive comorbid sample. So that means that they do have comorbid ADHD, 
they haven't posted an ADHD yet, but that's what the class part takes up as, well, that's probably ADHD maybe as well. And you kind of see that kind of makes sense. So in conclusion, so you can use chronology of the post to detect and explain comorbidity. Uh, yes. Uh, so transformers sometimes work much better than classical techniques. There's, in my opinion, huge opportunities to get a lot of data from social media to complement what you are doing, right? Which is looking at individual, looking at kind of large samples of individuals and taking physiological measurements uh, and taking kind of what they write down. But also, that's the only way to really hear a lot of people talking a lot about symptoms. Uh, get in touch with us, tweet at us, ask at us, uh, and we'll, we'll send you the PDF if you want. Thank you very much. All right, uh, great presentation. Um, a few questions, really interesting idea. I mean, I, I, I kind of think that this has been something that if you get working really well, you can give it to Reddit and say, hey, Reddit, here's like a, a way that you can like promote health and whatever, but um, maybe you buy some but um, many questions, particularly around the validation of the model. So effectively, my understanding is you've got some input data, which is free text from the post, and you're training a, a binary classification algorithm. And so um, did you feel that using accuracy was an okay metric because the, the data was quite balanced? Um, and did you look at other things like an ARROC, like the sensitivity, specificity, the effects of things? So we did. So we, we report the accuracy on a test set where uh, it's literally balanced since 50 uh, So when training, we uh, we tried different things. So you could either weight the cost functions such that the imbalance is uh, rectified uh, or we actually, what we do in practice is we just oversample the positives. So oversample the switches, uh, the switcher so that it's going to be uh, In terms of other metrics, we did those. Uh, we don't feel like the accuracy here is like the important part. We feel the explanation here is the important part. The accuracy just indicates that we're actually picking up on the patterns. So we're not just making pick up. Yeah. Um, so with your upsampling then, so you're doing, so you're balancing the data set in your training. Um, and then are you leaving, the, are you doing any balancing on the, the, the test, test set? The test is, so we report results on a, a test set that's balanced 50 Um That you then um, upsampled to balance on the test set, or the test set was just um, in the wild naturally balanced? No, it, it was not naturally balanced. We uh, we, we actually upsampled, but it's so large that it doesn't matter what you do, right? The reported number is going to be the same. Okay, okay. And then with the explainability piece, um, I found it really interesting. So when you're doing like the masking, basically to then um, see what was the negative or positive impact when you remove words out from the model. Did you do that um, on like, uh, you're looking at the impact on a model level, like a global on model? The on the on a model. Or on a patient to patient or? Well, no, level. so it's yeah. a particular, so it's a particular post. Yeah. And we're asking, is that the post by a switcher to the ADHD, we call it that, to the ADHD subreddit or, yeah. or is it not? And then for each, in this case, for each phrase, we show the difference between from the baseline to what happens if you map that word out. Okay, very cool. Ian, or the audience? Yeah, I think we're out of time. Oh, okay. sorry. sorry, I forgot. Um, thank you. Thank you.